Today's our final event. And again, I want to give thanks to Rio Tinto for uh, providing the funding for us to, to make this happen. I think it's really important that we that we provide the truth. Um, you know, we talk about truth and reconciliation, but uh, somewhere along the line, truth has been um, has been left out. So I'm very thankful that we we got this funding so that we can tell the truth and, and tell the truth from many different aspects. Uh, from uh, and today we're going to hear from Algonquin uh, people and be closing with the, and also from the Inuit people and we're going to be closing with the Squamish Nation um, this afternoon and today we have two two special presentations one we're going to have a presentation from uh, Tamara Starblanket who's going to talk about the genocide that happened in the residential school she wrote a book uh, Suffer the Little Children so we'll hear from her what she has to say about uh, proving genocide did happen to our people in the residential school and then we'll also hear from Eva Jewell. Dr. Eva Jewell will be joining us today on Zoom and she's uh, working at uh, what was known as Ryerson University. And she's uh, she does a yearly report on the, on the calls for uh, uh, action for the TRC. So she's gonna be talking about that. And it's so, it's so because Eva, uh, as I mentioned to her, I think that we're related because um, we come from the same area and my father was talking about the jewels and, and it turns out that we are related. She's going to be sharing some information about our um, my great, great grandfather, uh, Enoch Hill and, and his wife, uh, Gussie when they went to residential school and, and the mush hole. So that's going to be really exciting. I'm very excited to hear about that. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the day. Now I'll go, thank you, thank you. Raise my hands to you and, and to the Amish Nation and, and Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh for all that you do. And take it away, Shane. I'd like to introduce to you Shane Point. He's a proud member of the Musqueam Nation. He's a carver, he's an activist and he's a well-known speaker amongst the people to support not only our indigenous people, but all people. And he supports love, he supports activism, he supports indigenous rights, and he also supports our women, especially. He does a lot of work for our women. And he's very called upon all across the land to come and share the knowledge of our people. I'm very proud to introduce to you Shane Point. Oh, I want to start by saying this. My most favorite Coast Salish word is Natsamat. Natsamat translated to English simply means we are one. Natsamat, we are one. I believe that with all my heart and all my sincerity that we are one. When I listen to my friend Diana talk about today, talk about yesterday, lifted my heart up, in our Coast Salish language, lifted up my heart and my mind, Natsama, Natsama. First Nations people, Indigenous people, we are constantly moving everyone to oneness. We understand that in order to be a balanced society, that we need to be a part of it. And we welcome everyone and we work with everyone regardless of the violent history that we have had with them. Canada has not been nice to us. Europeans have not been nice to us. Others have not been nice to us. And yet, we are the ones who stand up and say, we need to be Natsamad, Natsamad Shkwalawan, one heart and one mind. The work that this team is doing is of not only the utmost importance, it's vital to all of us. With that, I want to say I'm proud 
to be a part of this moment. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh chant, I'm asking our collective ancestors and the infinite to please, please lift up our hearts and our minds. Help us to be strong and not some on. We are one. I'm asking that they provide us with the strength that we need to continue the excellent work of bringing everyone together. I'm a proud father of three daughters, proud grandfather of my grandchildren, of my great-grandchildren. My mother raised me. She's my first teacher, principal teacher in my life. I'm grateful to her my many grand aunts and aunties and older female cousins for the teachings that they've given to me, the direction that they've given to me. Of course, I haven't always followed those, but they're strong within me. And I do my best now to continue to do what our parents, grandparents, great great grandparents did and that is to be the best human beings we can be and to be not some up. with that enjoy the day listen listen to the words that are going to be spoken ha ha squall sacred words ha ha slachen those sacred words you're going to hear are sacred medicine. Medicine that is not only going to heal our hearts, but is going to bring oneness to all of us. Continue to do your best. Thank you very much. Hi, Brother Shane. It's always so heartwarming and it warms the soul when we hear your voice and your kind words. Hi, Tracy. so proud to have you here with us today. Okay, so unfortunately we have, um, Lavinia wasn't able to join us today, so I'm going to give you over to Jessica. Thank you, Kat. And you won't be applauding for me, but you will be applauding for my maternal grandmother, Elder Margaret Nault. And uh, Lavinia Brown is her sister-in-law. And Lavinia Brown is up outside of Rankin Inlet. And unfortunately, her internet wasn't reliable to be able to join us today. And so Margaret is going to join us. And strange to call my grandmother Margaret, <laughs> but uh, like to introduce her and uh, 
She was also born in Rankin Inlet and uh, has journeyed around Canada, um, well, what we commonly call Canada. And, uh, and she's going to tell you more about how maybe she came to be um, on these lands here and about her time and some memories up on the land uh, in what is now none of it. Uh, and so would you like to join us? And and Joan Cazales, my mother, and one of Margaret's daughters will be standing with her and perhaps also um, in conversation a little bit as well. Thank you. So there's your microphone there. And... Do you want me to pin it to you, or do you want to hold it? I'll hold it. You can hold it. I'll have something to hold. Okay. Yeah. You want to take your mask off? Can you it? Okay. You'll be the only person here in this bubble. Okay. Well, I've never done this before. I'm very nervous. My name is Margaret Nault. And I was born in Alvet, uh, no, Nunavut, in 1933. Lived with my mother. I have to talk about my mother because my mother was a very, very special person to me. If it wasn't for my mother, I wouldn't be here today. My mother taught me everything that she knew. She was a very strong person. She could hunt, she could trap, she could fish, she could do everything that a man could do. And then I don't remember when we moved from Alvea to Tavani, where my grandparents lived. And I lived with my grand we lived with my grandparents until I was five, I think, around that time. Then we moved to a little place called Turn Point, where my mom and my little sister, we uh, moved to her husband's place just out of Rankin. And that's where I lived. We, we had a very quiet life, but a very busy life. We lived off the land. We had very little supplies come. We had supplies come in once a year by boat. And then the rest of the year, we had to survive on on, on the land, like the, the caribou, the geese, the rabbits, the ptarmigan, whatever we could hunt. My mother could hunt. And, and, and my her husband was a trapper. So he would be gone for like two, 23 days at a time on his trap line. My mother also had a small trap line that she would go with him on his, when he'd go to trap his traps and then hers weren't that far. So she would do it in one day. She would go to the end of her trap line then walk back. And we had lots of chores to do, but uh, we never complained when it was nice weather we were allowed to go out and play we didn't have nothing to play with but we played in the snow or had an old drum and put it on the lake and made lots of noise or we would go hunt ptarmigan or we were always doing something in the winter in the winter everything is white everything is completely white so if we saw a little spot way far away, just maybe as big as this little microphone on the ice. We would watch it. And if it changed, changed different, like if it, if it moved, then my mother would go up the hill, which I call the big hill, which my daughter thinks is a mole hill. But anyway, <laughs> it was a big hill to me. We'd go up there and spy through the spyglass to see if it was an animal or if it was a dog team coming. 
And then we would all get excited because we knew we were going to have visitors because we very seldom got visitors. We lived all alone in this little point, just our house. There was nobody else there. Once in a while, some Inuks would come and maybe stay for a few days or a week or so close to us, and then we would have them. But otherwise, we had no visitors. So, so that's how we knew that we were getting company. Uh, then my mother would make a big pot of something, whatever she had, to feed them when they got there. We always wanted to feed people and share everything we had. Um, and then, then and, and our chores were, uh, we lived in a one-bedroom, one one-room house with all seven of us in there. And uh, in the summertime, it was just the house. But in the wintertime, we would have three igloos built onto the house so that we'd have place to store, to store things to be ready in case there was a big storm. We'd have one for, for food and one for ice because we had to chop our ice in the winter and haul it home and melt it. And the other one would be for coal and gas or oil for our lamps, which we had to light in the morning when we got up about seven, six or seven, and then leave the light on till about 10, and then turn it out and turn it back on again about 2.30 because we had very little daylight in the winter. Uh, the days were very short. So in those short days, we, uh, we did a lot of things. We went fishing, ice fishing in the winter, um, my brothers, my brother and my sister and I, and I would chop the holes in the ice, and then we would jig with a little stick and a piece of string with a homemade hook out of a nail, and catch a few little fish for supper. And that would be our uh, one of our things we did in a day. The rest of the time, well, we did, we did some some we did some learning in. Uh, uh, arithmetic and reading and spelling. We were taught a little bit of that, but um, uh, yeah, in those days, school was not important. Uh, my mother did send me out to a foster home for, for two years, so I went to school for two, two years from grade one to grade two. And then she sent for me to come back home. So I went back home and I never left, went back to school till I was 16 and, and went into grade three, which I was not very happy about being with all them little kids. But um, it wasn't important up there to go to school. But we had a good life. We, uh, we always had, we were never bored. We were never, ever bored because we always had something to do, and we made our own fun. We, we had little sleds, what we should call kamatik, and we would take them up that big hill and slide down, <laughs> which she thinks is a molehill. But anyway, <laughs> that was our excitement. Or we would go hunting ptarmigan, as I said, or, and I had a little trap line, too. I had two traps. So every second or third day, I would walk down to my little trap, to my little traps, and uh, never, I only caught one little fox in the whole time I was up there. And then uh, when I did catch that little fox, I couldn't kill him. So I had to walk all the way back home and get my mother to come and kill my little fox. And uh, I felt so sorry for him. But anyway, that was the way of life, right? Just like killing a little rabbit. Now I would never ever think about that. Or in the in the, when the when the birds fly to the north and to lay and they lay up there, the geese, the ducks, and all kinds of birds. My mother, the first goose would come around May, we would see him coming, and my mother would crunch us all down on the ground and we would honk like a goose so he would come down closer and my mom had a shotgun and she would shoot him out of the sky 
and we would have roast duck, roast goose for dinner. We lived all, all our meat was right off the land. We didn't have any any white man's meat, just all native meat. And uh, we I, now I call it comfort food, and I miss it very much because I still love my comfort food. Um, Oh, then, then, and we also ate seal meat, which we could catch in the winter because there was always open ice, open water far away from where we lived. You have to go by dog team to catch a seal. And then, and then we would eat the seal meat too. So we always had lots of meat. Our main diet was meat. I don't care if I ever had vegetables. And even today, I can live on straight meat or fish. So that's the winter. In the summer, it was uh, different. We had more work to do because we had fishnets that we had to uh, check every hour that the tide went out, which would be like all hours of the night. And sometimes we got too many fish and we'd have to make a second trip. And sometimes I'd be lazy and I would just bury them. <laughs> which I never ever told my mom but <laughs> and uh, then we would get that fish home and then we'd have to clean it in the salt water we would go down to the beach and clean it in the salt water and then we would make what we called Pepsi Pepsi or Pepsi whichever way you want to say it which is dried fish and we would dry them and we would have to stand out there all day long which have something, a rag or something, so the flies wouldn't get on them until they got a dry skin on them, right? So we had that for treats in the winter. And uh, and also, uh, the caribou came over through our little point too, in the beginning, the, sort of like the middle of July and the land would be just moving for three days. And they migrated through our little point. So then we would catch lots of deer and we would make mipku, which is dried meat. We called it mipku. And we would do the same thing with that when we dried it, like we dried the fish. And we also had that in the winter. And plus, when the, when the caribou are nice and fat, they have thin, thick fat on their rumps. And we would call that Nip, um, I know the one that one that went right out of my mind. Not Nipku. No. Anyway, it's fat, and it it keeps. No, that's frozen meat. We also eat frozen meat. She's bringing that up. We also ate our caribou meat in the winter when it was frozen. That was our like to suck ice cream for us, and frozen fish too. All that was so comfort food. Um, yeah, I don't know. How did you make it? Hmm? How did you make it? Oh, all, we were all born at home. We were never born in a hospital. I was born in in uh, in Albert, in uh, the minister's house because my mother was working for the minister at that time because she had lost her husband. And um, so that's before we moved to my grandpa's. And I, I don't remember exactly the right age I moved to my grandpa's, but uh, then uh, that which was to Vanny, which my grandfather and all my uncles were Hudson Bay post managers. So this was a post manager's place in Vanny. And um, I lost one little brother when he was eight. I don't remember him because I wasn't born yet, I don't think. And his little grave is in Tavani. And when the last time, when I left the north, that's the last thing I did was go and see his little grave. He was my oldest brother. Um, yeah, my mom uh, had all her children at home. One brother, my brother Ron, her youngest son, she had him all by herself because I was. 
at a at somebody some trapper's place because his wife was having a baby and he came to get me to go and stay with his wife because she was pregnant and he had to go on the trap line. So then he took me to my grandmother's and then my mother's husband, Foxy Brown, came down there and brought me and, I, and my brother wasn't supposed to be born yet. But when we got home, he was already born and my mother delivered him all by herself. Yeah. Yeah, my mother was a very, very strong woman. She could do anything, like I say. I'm, I'm, I really miss my mom. She, she had a long life. She lived till she was 95 years old. And uh, I, I had the privilege of having her stay with me for the last five years of her life, which I'll always be very thankful for that. Um, with my help of my kids. And these little grandkids, like Jesse was just little then, and my other daughter had a little son too, and they'd be running around in the house. And and my mother had a sore knee, and I remember her telling them, smarten up, you, you, you hurt my knee. And they said they were sorry, but she didn't, she didn't believe they were sorry because she was already 90, right? 92 or 93 when they were little. But... <laughs> And also, uh, we couldn't leave her alone. So uh, my kids, my daughters, and my sons, they all helped me because I worked. And my husband was very good, too, who has passed on, too. So um, Oh, yeah. And then, like, when we were, when we, we went to my, we left our, we left our house. In, on that little point to go down to my grandparents' house, place, which was called Turn Point, because my uncle's wife was having a baby. And my grandmother delivered all the babies down there, but there was a, a, a sad situation in December that year. My youngest aunt, Emma, had a baby, and my grandmother delivered it, and passed. she passed away. So my grandmother would not deliver babies after that so they sent for my mom so we went down there by dog team and uh, to my grandparents and uh, that was that little baby was born on May the 8th but by that time my grandfather's dog had had uh, a disease so everybody was at my grandparents because that's where the meeting place all the trappers my uncles all came there in the spring when the trapping was over and their dogs got all sick. So the men thought, well, they're not going to be able to trap the next year because they had their dogs were all dying because of this distempered disease that they had. So they decided to head to Churchill. So the men all went to Churchill and there was just my grandfather left with us. So then they all got jobs and then we were supposed to go back up there on the Hudson Bay boat. So my grandfather took us all in a canoe to Tavani in a, on a nice calm night, and we were all ready to get on the boat the next day. And they re, they said no, they weren't taking any passengers because of the polio. So there we were stuck there with the Hudson Bay Post managers, two young fellas, and all of us, nine of us, because my aunt and my aunt, my two cousins were there too. And uh, so I learned to write in a particular there through the Bible. There was this one man, a young man, that we would go to visit him in his tent, and he would teach us how to write, my cousin and I. So then we were stuck there till freeze up. So when freeze up came, we were all loaded onto a freighter plane and stood up leaning on our luggage and went to Churchill, Manitoba in 1949. And that was the last time I ever saw my little house and all our belongings were left behind. We had to start all over in Churchill. Uh, and that's the end of my little life story. That house is still standing. I went back. Oh. Uh,
So I went back with my brother and sister, um, Jessica was little, and to my grandmother's memorial. We took her ashes up to bury them on her land. And that house is still there. And we went, we ran, landed in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, and we took a Peterhead boat that my uncle John, her third brother, the youngest one from the Hayward. He uh, he drove the boat, steered the boat with my uncle Ronald, and we had elders and kids, and and we went across the Hudson's Bay to my to the point. I call it Emily's Point because that's my grandmother's land. And we arrive and we dock the boat, and we all get out and we're carrying all the gear up. And I never imagined that it would be so emotional to to step on that land. When I did. I, the tears just started to fall, and I didn't really understand why, but that's where my mom grew up. That's where I saw the big hill, <laughs> which was, I, I went to my Uncle Ronald, and I said, Uncle Ronald, where's the big hill that my mom used to climb? And he said, it's right there. I'm like, <laughs> okay, that maybe when she was little, because it was, I was expecting it to be taller, and she would have to make this big trek up this hill, but no, it was a, quite a small hill. But that house, uh, my uncle Ronald has fixed it up, and, and trappers still use it. They they use it um, to stop in and have a, a warm place to, to stay or uh, get away from the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes are like birds; they're huge. And uh, we had a huge feast up there. We had we brought everything. They they made do stew and salads, and we did it all up there. We hauled it all up to the beach, which is quite a long walk. When the tide's out. When the tide's out, yeah. And then when we were coming back. Um, across the Hudson Bay into Rankin Inlet again. We were coming through this little passage and the boat hit a big, huge rock and thing and it went over on its side. And all those people were on the boat. Nobody died. Nobody was hurt. My Uncle Ronald saved a woman by pulling her off in by her hair. And uh, it was amazing. But I was never scared because my Uncle John was driving the boat and I, I trusted him with my life. My sister and I stayed on the boat while they righted it. Everybody else went off um, in safety boats. Everybody, it was amazing because we, we were over and it was like people were on the beach waving at us to come because when a boat comes in, it's exciting. And so then when the boat went over, all these boats all of a sudden started coming and the rescue boats were there in a second. And they took all the people off the boat, but my sister and I stayed on the boat and we couldn't figure out why all the men we're standing on the front of the boat facing us. We're like, what are we doing? We were waving at them. Well, they were trying to right the boat, trying to get it <laughs> right. We had no clue. We're not boaters. And we went into Rankin and my Aunt Lavinia, my Aunt Lavinia, who was supposed to speak, she was there at home and she made a huge caribou feast. And we had caribou when we got back and it was amazing. But that, my grandmother's land is, it's a beautiful, just tundra. But it's beautiful. And that's why the big hill is big, because the land is flat. <laughs> you know? So a hill to me is big, right? <laughs> yeah, no trees. No trees. No trees. Um, I grew up listening to my mother speak and tell stories, and my grandmother as well, tell stories. And um, it just, you know, warms my heart. I, I love to tell stories to my grandkids, but not to a lot of people. I'll, I'll, I tell them many, many stories, but I, I can't think of them. I used to tell them stories like that when, to try and make them go to sleep when I babysat them, you know. But there's a lot more to my life up there, but um, I just it just doesn't want to come today. But my grandkids all know because I've told them. I've told their stories, wolf stories, um, all those things. My grandmother sewed all of their... Oh, yes. My grandmother was a beautiful yeah. sewer, too. Also, besides being all the other things that she was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when we when we left my grandparents, I forgot to say this, uh, when, when my mom went to live with her husband at this Foxy Point, we went down there by dog team. And uh, my little sister was in the Amautic, and I can still see... Are in there, and we stopped at this one place where we, you've probably all heard about tutus, the Jenny tutu and um, Jordan tutu, 
And they were just young then, and we stopped at their place for bannock and tea. And their two two little boys were there, and they were stock naked. I'll never forget that. I've never seen a boy naked in my life. <laughs> and I was only five. <laughs> Yeah, so all kinds of little stories like that I tell my grandkids, but. Uh, she only wore traditional clothes, made of fur. Yeah, steel skin, in the winter. In the winter, and never had a pair of shoes on her feet till she was. I was six, I think. Six years old, she wore a stomach. And, and, and I, my first pair of shoes, and I wouldn't take them off, and they hurt my feet so bad. And I wouldn't take them off. Yeah, so lots of little things. But it was a good life. I, I'm not sorry for the life I had up there. It was a very, very good life. It was very, very free. Everything is free. Pick berries, whatever. Walk wherever you want. There's nobody say you can't do this or, or you can't do that. And I really miss it. And I guess I always will. When I step up back up to Rankin, I've been up there four times since I left when I was 16. And when I step on that land, I feel so free. I just feel so free. When I, the minute I step on that land, I'm home. Yeah. But I've had a good life too, right? I, I have had eight children of my own and a couple of foster kids. So there was always busy, busy house. But I can't complain about my life that I had either. I had a good husband and... and uh, who passed away, but uh, but I'm very thankful for the life that I had on the land. It's, it's a beautiful land, and I wish everybody could go up and and see how free it is, and how how everybody is so friendly, and they want to feed you all the time, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. Share, share everything, you know. You you'd get a big whale, and everybody would go down to the beach, and all get eat whatever they wanted. There was no nobody nobody was turned away whether you need them or not. It was a good life. Yeah. What part of the whale? Just the top part of the whale. Just there's there's a layer like that that's like boiled eggs, I guess you could call it. Soft. And then there's another little film there. Then there's the blubber. You take all the blubber off and you just eat the top of it. Raw or cooked. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I never thought I would be able to do this, but uh, with all the support I have, it was lovely. It would be so, much. so, Jessica's going to read something from my Aunt Lavinia that she has just sent her. So, Virginia Brown, who is Margaret's sister-in-law, was the first female mayor of Rankin Inlet and also deputy premier. And she has a Wikipedia page and on it, it does not mention at all in a single word that she's an artist but she is an internationally exhibited, collected um, textile artist and how Margaret was speaking on sewing and how everyone learned how to sew. It was a survival skill up in the North. And so uh, Lavinia has created beautiful wall hangings that we have some of in the family home. And uh, she shared a story with me through Facebook Messenger about her mother teaching her how to sew. And so I've transcribed it here and I'll share it with you. Just gonna switch hands. So this is in, in her words. I was very young when my mother was trying to teach me how, oh, pardon me, sorry, wrong line. <laughs> okay, and this is from April. Uh, 2021. I wish to add in something of my own experience and just don't quite know how to put it in words for healing. Our nation and probably many other Indigenous people have practiced this method since creation. Here's one of my earliest experiences in my learning how to sew. 
I was very young when my mother was trying to teach me how to sew. I was so stubborn and lazy to sew. I didn't want to learn how to sew. I thought I would be too ajak, like can't do it, can't learn how to sew. But I never argued with my mother. I listened to my mother. That was the hardest for me to do as I hated everything about sewing. Then I left home and got married at a very young age. What did I know about love and hurts? What did I know about having a husband? The hardest life lesson was to live with a husband and I was told by my mother to obey my husband, to honor my husband, that he's my husband now and that he's my boss. Okay, mother dear. I listened to everything she said and obeyed her words. As years went by, I started to enjoy my sewing. There were times I needed to cry and could not cry in front of others. I was told more than once that crying is like tap water. You turn it on and you turn it off. My goodness, what impact those such cowardly words had on me for many years. So I learned in my young life why exactly my mother wanted me to learn so badly how to sew. There's a very big purpose in learning the skills of sewing. The Inuit women had to sew all the time for survival purposes and for the many uses and skills of sewing. Each man and woman had a set of skills for survival and other purposes. So anyway, as young as I was, there were times I was hurting. And in those days, we never knew how to talk as we were away from family and our parents. A lot of young people talk to me and over the years, I keep hearing that it's very hard to talk to parents about personal issues. Well, then I learned to have more patience with my sewing, remembering what my dear mother said. My mother once said, what you hear and what you see will always come back to you. So I would keep practicing my sewing and the more I got into my sewing, I started to really enjoy it. Anyway, as a young wife, I got very depressed and anxiety set in. At 19 years old, I was diagnosed with anxiety attacks. I would cry without anyone knowing. As we lived down south, I got more and more into sewing. There were times I couldn't wait to sew. Little did I know my sewing was helping me to heal. Over the years, I learned that I, Simak, had peace. Here, I would cry as I was sewing and no one knew except myself and our creator. From then on, I learned why my mother forced me to learn sewing. She must have known I needed the company and to talk to myself. She must have known sewing was a tool for survival as well as medicine, known as therapeutic for oneself, to be able to look after ourselves when there are no words to share with someone. Or this, cathartic a perfect word to describe healing, of relieving, of purging, of freedom. Yes, our Inuit ancestors didn't just sit around doing nothing. They developed all the tools and things needed to survive in the harshest and coldest environment. Even I am so amazed of this. Who in the world would, have, would ever think of building a shelter out of snow for their survival? This is my quote, as I am absolutely amazed and proud of our Inuit heritage. Hey, probably. So here is my letter to you for your, oh, this, these are words of her to me. Here's my letter to you for your application, okay? Thank you for asking me if I would be interested in being, oh, that's personal, being your mentor. It would be my honor to teach you some sewing as well as storytelling and pass on some Inuit culture to you, whatever you might be interested. I will try to teach you. And so those are the words of Lavinia Brown. And she is a teacher. She's also had a long, full life, with many, many stories that's not going to speak on her behalf. However, uh, she's always been very open with her teachings and I'm not sure that she would ever say no to anyone who asked her for 
knowledge for the teachings that she carries. And that includes Indigenous folks and non-Indigenous folks. And she's always very busy sewing. And, uh, and so Margaret, my grandmother, she's done a lot of knitting. And my mother also, has, as long as I remember, has, has sewn and sewed me clothes when I was little, whether I liked it or not, matching dresses with my little sister and uh, Shannon, who can't be here today. Um, and so recently, uh, I, just, I should have brought the photo, but it was the three of us sitting at the dining room table at my mother and grandmother's home, lived in the same home. And my mother was teaching me how to beat and she was learning how to make moccasins. And my grandmother was teaching her the ways from her knowledge on making cummings. And I asked my sister, can you take a picture? It's the three generations of reclaiming our culture, reclaiming these teachings with the wisdom that she carries in our hands, relearning how to do it. And I haven't yet been up to the land, but even as my mother was speaking of it, I started to tear up and it's calling me back home. And so these teachings that we are reclaiming, and I'm sure many people can relate to that, have been such good medicine. And so um, was it a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago, my mother started to teach me how to sew. And so, and my grandmother taught me how to knit when I was little and it's starting to pick that back up. and how these teachings from our elders I'm so grateful for and so grateful that my grandma is here to share what she can. So thank you so much. And there's some questions here that um, she's gonna answer and I'll pass this back. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is the first question is from Rhoda. Um, no, I never mute, knew Greta. Malo, do we read the question out? Yeah. I'll read the question out first. From Rhoda Bergquist. I wonder if you knew my mom, Greta Malo. My mom cooked through the territories. It was, an, it was so amazing hearing my mom tell of the differences in the culture. We're from Manitoba. She loved the Inuit culture. I inherited all her earrings. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't know Greta? No, I didn't know her. We, we never uh, ventured anywhere from our little house on the point. From, from the time I was there, from when I was five till I was 15. So um, I met people that came to the point, but I never met people outside the point. Sorry about that. Well, the next question is, do you see any effects of residential schools in your area? Well, that's another thing too, right? We, I, I knew there was a school. I never knew there was a school in Chesterfield in the, when I lived up there. I knew there was a hospital there that was run by the Catholic Church, but I never, you know, you, you don't see people, you don't get any information, right? So I never knew any of that until I got older and then my my sister-in-law was in there and then I got to learn about it. I, my, my dear sister-in-law, Lavinia, is the one that made this, got this amount it made for me and uh, I love her dearly. She yeah. was in residential school. Yeah, she was in the residential school with her sisters. Yeah so. yeah, so that's that. And the next question is, what life lessons would help young people today? Well, I'd say uh, go with your culture, listen to your parents, and always be proud of who you are. That would be my, and that's what I always taught my kids, to be proud of who you are. And that's what we have to do. We have to be proud of who we are and fight for what we want. Okay. That's it. That's it. Any questions from the audience? Oh. Can you speak more about um, the amount of? My Mautic. Can you tell about what, it, what it's for? Uh, well, my Mautic is a woman's uh, coat, I guess you'd call it. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a big hood 
There's a pouch in the back for the baby to go in. The baby goes in the back. And then you bring the hood up this way so the baby can peek out through here. It's super cute. And then <laughs> it, it's very cold up there and you live in they live in igloos, so they nurse their babies. And that's why these are big puppy sleeves, because they just maneuver that baby through here and bring it here and the little head goes in here and the baby nurses. So that's all about the amount. Of and there's winter ones and summer ones. Yeah, these, this is a summer one. The winter ones are made with um, caribou skins with the, the fur inside and the fur outside. And they're very decorative. I have pictures of my my mom in her amaltics and uh, babies on her back, but I don't know which baby it was, right? But uh, they're very warm. When we traveled on, from, from my grandparents to, to her husband's point, uh, my little sister was in the Amotic, and I was tied on the sled, on the Akamotik. We call them Akamotiks. Uh, they're wooden sleds that are made by, by Inuit people. That was their, their sleds. We didn't have toboggans and ready-made sleds. We had to make them ourselves. Like most things up there you made yourself? Yeah, even our dog harnesses. And the harnesses were all made by my mother and the lines were made from uh, there's a big animal called a square flipper i think it's a bearded seal which is very big and that's what the, the dog traces were made out of and a lot of um, inuk elders they uh, did a lot of carving from the tusks of walruses and they would make the little connection out of ivory to connect the, the, the harness the, the line to go on to so we could hook it to your sleigh. Everything was homemade up there. We had to make everything. Caribou skins, we had to have, make our own uh, stretching tools. We had to make our own sharp ones to scrape the vellum off to make them soft. We had ulus to, to clean our fish, they were all homemade. <coughs> Can you, can you yeah. explain what an ulu is to people who might not know? An ulu? Yeah. An ulu is a woman's knife that comes out, I don't know how, how to say that. It's rounded. Yeah, it's rounded blade with a little handle on top. And that's an ulu is a woman's knife that she uses for everything. She uses it for skinning caribou or cleaning seal skins or whatever. That's ulu is uh, what she uses. And uh, another thing my mother used to do um, is um, if you wanted to have white seal skin, then you had to put a big pot of water outside the cell in the summer, a big pot of water on a, on a homemade stove out of rocks with boiling water in it. And you dip that seal skin in it and then all the fur comes off and it's white. If you wanted black, then you had to use your ulu very, very careful and take the, the hair off of the skin. And then you had black leather, or black seal skin, and you had white seal skin. And a lot of the white seal skin were for, mother, for women's stomachs and little girls, or for fancy things, right? It's all made out of the same thing, all made out of seal skin. Well, we we didn't really. We 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 um, we rested on Sunday. My mother never sewed on Sunday, but we never. Um, I think we knew we knew the Lord's Prayer, but we never uh, practiced, practiced religion. Um, but on Sundays was the rest. My mother never sewed on Sundays, and she never cut out patterns or anything on Sundays because she said that was like cutting glass. So that's I guess that's the way we celebrated our religion. But we were isolated. We we're just my mom and, and her husband and us kids in a, on a little point. 
and I don't think they ever smudged like like well no. they do down here. There was never any that kind of a ceremony. Yeah. So they had a, a lamp. What was the lamp called? Oh, we had a, a, a kudlik, which was a little lamp that was sort of like a half moon. And that's another thing. What we did in the summer, we we saved all the oils to burn in the Inuit people. We didn't because we lived in a house, but uh, the people that lived in igloos or tents, that's what they used to heat their igloo, is that little kudlik. We always had a kettle hanging up there, so they always have hot water for tea, or they would cook all day something in that from that little light. Yeah, yeah seal oil, just seal oil. Everything's off the land. Everything's from up there. You could go up there and live, go hunting or pick berries, or you always go, always ready for the next season. We were always taught never to waste. So if we found a nest that had five eggs in it, you don't touch it because some of those eggs are already hatching. Only can took one or two eggs out of the nest because otherwise you won't have any for next year. That's what we were taught. Yeah. Well, I think that I think my first 16 years of life, I ate the best food. I, there was no preservatives in our food, and so we all got really good starts. And all my family, all my brothers and sisters, are very healthy. And that's thanks to my dear mom that knew how to cook and, and hunt and. I'm so proud of my mom. Yeah. So much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you very much. So we we have a, a short video from Lavinia Brown. And it is not addressing us. It's actually uh, addressing the graduation class um, of this year. But you can see her on the land in her own amount. And so um, just thought to show you who Lavinia Brown is a little, just a little glimpse of that as well. And, and a bit of the land. So if you want to see it. Thank you for asking me to say a few words for the graduating students of Convocation 2021 at the University of Winnipeg and Regions. This is an honor for me to say a few words. I'm so proud of each of every one of you. In ranking of it, uh, it's kind of windy, but uh, it's important to, uh, to say these few words and to also congratulate and understand there's beautiful students graduating as well. So, congratulations. We're very proud of you. You make us proud in the world. And thank the, the University of Winnipeg and the Aboriginal Center of Environment for their staff and for their support. All the students, please stay, stay safe. And I'm proud of you. I'm really happy to raise your graduation day. Thank you. And so she, she sends her regards and uh, that she's not able to, to make it here. But um, yeah, I just hopefully she'll be able to join us again in future. She has joined um, Pacific Association of First Nations Women in um, in guiding some some of her sewing teachings. And so in that, um, she shared that. Uh, well, I knew this anyways, but 
I'm able to share this with you, that uh, she was born on the tundra. Her family was on the dog sled and they were en route somewhere um, with the dog team. And her mother went into labor. And so I believe they just made it in somewhere, but that she was born on the open tundra. And, and just as my great grandmother, Emily, that she birthed one of her own babies on her own. So I'm beginning to pick up that these are not uncommon instances. And so the, the strengths of women and, uh, and just sure survival and, uh, and instinct. And so as Kat was asking about, um, I guess about the traditional spiritual practices and how, um, folks, um, from different nations smudge that, um, I personally am not aware of any Inuit spiritual practices, and I think mostly because the existence is based purely on survival and a deep, deep connection to the land and what the land tells us. And so um, from my knowledge of um, very, not a lot of knowledge, but of different Indigenous languages, that a lot of them don't have natural words for sacred, for ceremony, because that was the way of life. Everything is sacred. And when we're connected to the land and all that it provides, then all of our actions are in right. If all of our actions are in right relations, then everything is sacred. And so the Inuit people live their life as such, living every way from the land and that that is sacred and that in itself is a spiritual practice. And so um, I know that um, there are shamans, um, different medicine people, um, but again, um, in my own lineage and ancestry that my grandmother lived very isolated. And so those folks very well may have coexisted in the same territory, but never came into contact with them. And so those are not um, my own ancestral teachings, which come from her. Um, and Lavinia might have more to, to share on that. So um, this has the excellent question. Thank you, because it's definitely sparked my own curiosity of what other teachings there could be. And it runs so, so deep. Um, but yeah, that the land provides everything that we need and even being in an urban environment that that is still true that to go out and connect to the land however we can even if it's not your own home territory maybe ask permissions if you need to depending on where you are but that there's medicine there for you always um, which is something that I've learned from from reclaiming my heritage and from things that have been passed down to me um, are there any other questions Okay. And is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, we, we, we had Inuktitut names, and my Inuktitut name is Takayoayak. That is my Inuktitut name, and Taki for short. But um, I never, only Inuk people call me that. My family never knew of it, and I never thought anything of it until Lavinia. One time messaged me on Facebook and said, I never even told anybody. And Lavinia messaged me one day and she said, Arch, do you know that you have an Inuktitut name? She said, we were talking to some elders about a graveside that we didn't know who, who was there. And they told us about you, that your name was Sakayalia. So I found out I had an Inuktitut name. Oh, and another thing I wanted to say to you is that um, I know we live isolated, but we did get news once in a while, and we never heard of any crime there, and never heard of any alcohol up there either. We had, uh, my mom always had a, a bottle of brandy, but that was for medicine. If you fainted, then you got that forced into your mouth to bring you out of your paint, and it was terrible tasting. But that's the only alcohol I knew about in my life up there. Something important. Oh. 
it used to be. It isn't that way anymore. That's the way it used to be. There was no alcohol. Nobody drank. 